Hi, Stephen. Good morning. Hey, good afternoon. Today, uh, we're going to be talking about how the pandemic changed the way revenue management systems and ideas is, uh, is handling data and what changed internally due to the pandemic and what kind of changes are going to be permanent and what kind of changes are, are going to be temporary. So we're going to explore uh, that topic. And uh, if you could start with a like, short introduction, that, that would be great. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on your, your chat today. I really appreciate it. As you mentioned, I'm Stephen. I work at Ideas. I have, I guess, two primary responsibilities at Ideas. One is overseeing product development from a, a product management perspective for our largest revenue management systems, including a G3 revenue management system. This is where our largest install base is today. And also leading a new support function. Uh, we call that product success. And that group is really focused on dealing with the more complex out of the ordinary situations. And to say that there was more of a need for that team than ever over the last 12 months might be an understatement. So it was great that we had started to ramp up that team probably just on time. And they really help us to start to look at things like where Clients have a new unusual need or a need to deploy something en masse across a large number of properties. And of course, the pandemic brought many an opportunity where our clients had less available resource and we really had to make sure that we could help them to execute things en masse across a very short time frame. And so we really changed uh, that service mentality to support clients as best we could in those difficult situations. So those are sort of the two, I guess, functions that I am responsible for today, Ideas. Great. Yeah, I guess if you set up this team uh, or this project before the pandemic, I guess it was a very good timing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How are you uh, surviving during the, the pandemic? How have you experienced this uh, situation? Did you start uh, baking bread? Did anything change uh, for you? The biggest thing I think that changed for me is in um, 2019, I, I traveled about 285,000 miles. And then, of course, in uh, 2020, after late February, that stopped very abruptly. And so you get used to your own uh, four walls here uh, pretty quickly. I guess I'd always been pretty into running. I don't know if you know much about the weather here, but Minnesota will give Europe a run for its money when it comes to winter. In uh, Celsius, you you can get down past minus 30 um, Celsius and, and minus 50 with wind chills. So sometimes running outside in the winter gets a little bit challenging. Um, so I actually got really into, um, I'm going to sound like one of those people here in a sec, but I've got really into um, Peloton. Uh, I, I ordered one actually just before the pandemic it was even a, a thing really in North America. And so I was lucky to get that delivered just as it was becoming or, or ramping up as a, as a fad. But yeah, I've, I've enjoyed uh, using that as my daily salvation, I guess, um, and maybe dabbled in a TikTok dance or two. What about yourself? Have you um, gotten into anything like that? Any, any new crazes or stepped up any um, goals that you were working on? I started reading uh, on a regular basis. So now it's part of my like, morning uh, routine. This year, the target is 52 books. Um, I think I, I've done eight already, so I'm kind of on track. And I have also lost a lot of uh, weight. I went on this uh, hardcore weight loss program. I ended up losing uh, 18 kilograms in, in nine months. So that was like a, a big uh, life change for me. Wow. Great job. And yeah, so reflecting on what you said about Minnesota Vinters, I had uh, the opportunity to, uh, to experience it. And, and uh, I also did running, I think. For me, the, the coldest was minus 20. Looking back, I, I don't know how I did it, but I remember going out yeah. running in the snow. I guess it makes you tougher. Yeah, ice in your eyebrows when you come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Uh, what are you looking most uh, forward to uh, as hopefully the restrictions will become less and less in the US? Honestly, it's probably seeing my, my family. This is, um, it's probably, it will probably be about two years since I'll have seen any of them um, oh, wow. by the time it rolls around. So I used to get back and forwards across to Europe pretty regularly, but uh, 
the distance of the 4,000 miles or so that it is now to home seems a little longer after the, the gap of two years. So that probably sounds really stealthy, but it's um, you, you miss all those little things like uh, small family arguments over Christmas time. Um, so hopefully they'll come back this year. Are there things that you're, uh, you're looking forward to again when, when things come back? I'm also visiting my family. I was uh, lucky enough to be able to do it last September. And second place is going uh, visiting the pub for a pint. Yeah, I watched a British TV show just the other day, and it was and it was funny. I realized how long it had been since I heard someone say, "Let's go for a pint." It's not not a common expression this side of the Atlantic. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. My first question would be: um, I've heard that some hoteliers uh, argue that RMS systems are of no use in this uh, COVID period with uh, relatively low demand uh, levels. Um, I guess it's kind of changing with the demand coming back, but still in a lot of destinations, the demand is low. And uh, what's your answer to that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we heard that a lot. And in fact, even from some very senior industry executives, especially around the start of the pandemic, that with the reliance or, or strong reliance on historical data from the reservation level, that revenue management systems essentially were rendered pretty useless because of the pandemic. And this was where we actually had some functionality that was designed to help us to react very quickly to changes that are common in hospitality, but not actually even in other travel sectors. And we had to leverage this functionality and adapt it to make sure that it could adapt to the even more prolific changes that were being seen due to COVID. That statement is actually fairly rooted in the way that revenue management systems have worked for an enduring period of time. And typically, what you end up with is that the system will use all of the history, it will start to see that ramp down, and it will do over smoothing. So the demand forecast will be too high during the period where the demand drops, and it will be too slow to recover um, as things pick back up. Or another common approach is that you're essentially looking back at equivalent periods from the the prior year. The way that our system has been designed is to look for exceptional events, not just in the sense of what you might call a special event, um, and of course your specialty from the event intelligence perspective, but also large shifts in business. So even in normal times, hospitality companies have made changes like introducing products like changeable for a fee. And those new products have have brought a large shift of business from flexible rate into those products in normal times. Or as corporate accounts are gained or lost, you can see large shifts of business up or down. The same could apply, for example, if you lose an airline contract or similar. And our system had to be able to deal with those types of shift in normal times. And so we adapted that functionality to say, be more sensitive to those type of changes as long as you've got at least two weeks of evidence that shows either a shift down or more importantly, a shift up. And so that is now looking for all different types of change. That could be an overall level of business drop It could be shift between different types of business because, of course, you have seen even in hotels that have continued to do well during the pandemic, that's because business has shifted out of corporate and into leisure segments. It's shifted out of group and into transient. And the day of week patterns, of course, have shifted aggressively towards favoring weekends where people are in drive destinations, often heading to oceans or lakefront properties, um, particularly on those weekend days. And so we really adapted the way that you leverage the data that you have to react much more quickly to make sure that you're really adapting in the right way with the data that you have. So that allows us to do things like say, well, normally I can detect seasonality by looking at a period of time and seeing like it's a normal shift up or down And it may have a trend up or a trend down that's been occurring for a period. But that isn't what you're seeing here. That, of course, what you're seeing is either a very significant shift down or shift up as business starts to recover. We made several other changes like that to also react more quickly to future business on the books. So typically, systems have some expectation. Let's say that you will have 10 rooms on the books in a particular segment 60 days out. 
And if you don't have, if you have six or five or even two or three, you might not react too aggressively because it might still be within what you might call a statistical confidence. And in normal times, you wouldn't react too aggressively to that. But now you react to make sure that you are still setting appropriate forecasts and therefore controls as a result of either too little on the books or as more importantly, as recovery starts, having more on the books than, than you expected to have. And those things, in addition to changes that we made to how we leverage things like competitor data to make sure that you quickly recalibrate what in some markets was a very dramatic impact on how competitors were positioning themselves or their pricing strategy was really important to make sure that the system was geared up to continue to produce appropriate controls. Because our systems, of course, do operate even in normal times in markets that see very low seasons. And it's still important that they react appropriately. For example, dropping the price very aggressively in places where there's very little demand doesn't mean you're going to generate more demand. And that was never more true than in some of the cases where there were these severe restrictions. Because, of course, hotels were all fighting for what in some cases was limited remaining demand. But you weren't going to capture more of it just by dropping the price. You're not going to generate more demand in those cases. So making sure that those systems were geared up to use the data they had in a really appropriate way and to react much more quickly in, and, and in a more agile way with the data that they had was really important to make sure that you continue to produce controls that are business appropriate, both for the period where there's a drop in demand, but more importantly, that the system is ready to react as business picks up again. When did you implement these uh, changes? I assume a couple of weeks or months after the pandemic hit uh, in earnest. We ramped up our task force for COVID changes or COVID-related product analytics and service changes in March. And as part of that, we actually set up a new set of internal monitoring tools also, because it's not only important to implement these analytics changes, but it's also important that we more proactively monitor very different things. So in normal periods, you'd be looking for things like, have you seen a large change year on year and seasonality and trends? But this, of course, is a prolific change. And so we also had to implement new monitoring tools internally that allowed our teams to identify properties that maybe, for example, the current quarter has shown a really large drop or a really large increase, but the future forecast beyond that has not reacted appropriately yet. And those are the properties that we need to flag for further investigation. Or alternatively, we wanted to proactively reach out to properties where Unfortunately, we know that many markets maybe took pricing decisions or revenue management strategy decisions that might, might not be recommended. They, they did drop prices pretty aggressively, even though that might not generate more demand. And in some cases, that could have been a function of the system that they were using too. So it might not have been the user's choice. However, in those periods, you want to make sure that what doesn't happen is that you're then pricing yourself out of the market. Because... As we were heading then into spring and summer, the lower rate that was available or the lower bound on the rates that the system could select could then be way above the average competitor rates. And so we created tools like that that allowed us to reach out proactively to properties to say, let's um, check if your pricing strategy needs a review so that you at least remain competitive. So we implemented those tools in, in March last year, and we've continued to adapt them through an agile process to really look at every week at the top and bottom performing properties to say, what can we learn? How can we take what's happened? Where are the properties that have reacted the best to those aggressive market shifts starting in Asia, of course, heading into places like Seattle and New York and in, in the US as the, as the pandemic hit here, properties in Italy, um, those places where there was clear evidence earliest, um, how do you learn from those and, and start to fold them in? So that's something that's been an enduring part of the way that we've changed the way we work since uh, since March of last year. So uh, if I understand correctly, you both uh, recalibrated the learning from the, the markets that were hit the first. 
you on one hand uh, recalibrated your algorithms to be uh, to a more sensitive level and also you gave uh, I don't know if I can say like a bigger weight to uh, to external data sources like uh, competitor rate data. Yeah, absolutely. So there was there was more weight, I guess, given to recent pa uh, recent past data where it was more predictive. So where the system sees that that is likely to produce better forecasting outcomes, we looked to learn from the data sets we had from markets hit first and absolutely made sure that we folded in market and competitor data more rapidly and, and more appropriately as it became available to, to really show where markets were changing their, their pricing or, or um, revenue management practice, absolutely. And uh, do you see these uh, recalibrations and the shift from past data or past based data to external data sources and forward looking uh, data sources, something that will stick around even after the, the pandemic from your side? I think that lots of these pieces will remain. And I think the biggest one is probably how agile the system has to be. And that is being more alert or adept at working out which particular data sources are producing the best outcomes. Now, that's a fine balance in revenue management because, of course, users need to trust the systems as well. They need to be comfortable and confident in the system's outputs that it might not be exactly what you would do as a as a user doing revenue management individually but that's where there's this fine balance to strike between using the right data adapting quickly but still being able to give users that comfort about where those decisions came from and so from that perspective i i definitely see a bigger and continued shift to leveraging more external sources especially as things like in your world, as you know, events have changed so dramatically and so quickly. You know, they've been rescheduled, downsized, moved from partially virtual to fully virtual in some cases, back and forth between the two. Dates have shifted, some have cancelled and, and so on and so forth. And that really fluid situation has created a lot of focus on how do we make sure that we're giving the system or any systems helping us to make automated decisions the best inputs that they can help us to support those outputs. The other reason I think that that will be probably more prolific is that a larger change may be that at least for a period of time, hotels will probably not move back to the same labor models that they had in revenue management. So I think revenue management was one of the places where you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, deep learning, revenue science techniques had been used most. And it's an area where Ideas has always tried to say, instead of just throwing data sources into the system for review, you should really try to make sure you understand them. And a good example is our partnership with TravelClick for Demand360 data. We're not asking the user to tell us what the influence of that is. We really see that as our responsibility to say, look at how your competitors' data evolves and, and continues to evolve. And is that something that will help you to actually better model the behavior of the demand for your properties? And if that's the case, then it absolutely should be used to fold in and improve future outcomes from the system's perspective. So these are the types of area where I think we need to see continued investment from revenue management systems and you know, the hospitality industry as a whole is, you know, not just throwing more data at things from a visualization perspective, but really looking to say which of these external data sources drive value and can be used in the most effective way to drive value for decision making purposes. That's a very good point to to be able to determine which data sources actually make sense and which which move the needle in terms of uh, forecast uh, accuracy. I've seen cases where, yep. where RMS systems say, hey, look, we've got you know weather data, how cool, or X data or new uh, Y data points just for the marketing sake of it. While I agree with data sources have to be selected based on their ability to be able to improve the, the forecast or not. That's a good point. But I think even, even those data sources, it's, it's also about where they're helpful too, because you know those data sources like weather, are you going to change your trip to London because it's going to rain? Unlikely. But are you going to be stuck in an airport potentially because of extreme weather in London? 
very likely. You know, we know how well uh, our, our good friends at Heathrow deal with snow, for example. So there are things like that, that, you know, there's there's pockets of places where that data is really helpful. Um, another, another one, for example, being flight patterns that in and out of island destinations, that could be really helpful. But as you said, it's about, you know, for that hotel, which specific pieces of data that you can get your hands on are helpful to that property to really help to be predictive. And that's an area that we've spent a lot of time continuing to focus on is the recovery situation is not even the same for two properties side by side. You know, one that was very heavily corporate filled before the pandemic will probably recover much more slowly than one an, an adjacent property, maybe even in the same brand that was more leisure based. And the same is true of, you know, properties that were geared up for large conferences and events or groups that, you know, they're probably going to have to change their focus to more transient leisure in order to recover faster. And so there's a really a big need to focus on the fact that you're going to see different shifts, different levels of data that are helpful to individual properties even. And it's really about learning and adapting to what's helping that property's behavior and forecast team. Yes, that can be called the uh, ind individualization of uh, revenue management uh, on a property level. So that's exciting yeah, stuff. Absolutely. What do you think will be the significance of event uh, data as markets will start to recover? This is an area where we've started to do quite a bit of research around how you can best leverage and, and score events, I think. It's, it's always been a focus for hotels and or hotel revenue management systems to look to isolate periods of time, regardless of what you call them. On the idea side, of course, we've, we've always called them special events, if anyone, anyone wasn't aware of that. Now, for us, a special event could be positive or negative. It could be many different causes. And I think that was one of the big asks at first is like, is this just a special event? And of course, it's now um, a much more enduring event than, than that. What will be important, though, I think, is trying to identify which events are useful for the system. And today, there's a big reliance on the user to at least provide those inputs or a data source to provide those inputs in terms of here's all the events we, we think are helpful. And one of the things that we've always tried to do <clears throat> in our newest platform is to try to establish the statistical significance of the event. So is this event significant enough that it should or should not be used for normal forecasting. So how different is it to normal forecasting patterns? But there's a new level of complexity, I think, with the pandemic, because now we have to say things like, okay, will Memorial Day or Easter behave this year like it did 2019 or 2020 or some other year prior to that? And so having a realistic reference of, you know, what's really happening for these events is, is going to be important. So th there is going to need to be continued investment in establishing the significance of events and how to cluster like events, but still make sure that the user can recognize what they want to. So a good example is whether it's Beyonce or Taylor Swift, or whether it's Barcelona or Juventus playing, the system doesn't really care it really cares that it's a high impacting event and that it will have a particular type of impact on what type of demand you see, when that demand booked and what the demand is willing to pay. And so this is where there's, there's going to be a more of a shift as well in terms of the system might want to see that as a high demand concert, high demand soccer match, football match, but the user wants to see who is actually playing or what specific event is, is playing um, at that time. And so that divergence is likely to be something that will continue as well, I think. That's an area that we've continued to do a lot of research on over the last 12 months is how to better leverage uh, event data from external sources. And uh, do you think events can be uh, one of the drivers for properties that are in destinations that are heavily influenced by local events going forward, coming out of the pandemic? I've read um, various sources uh, on corporate uh, travel rebounding slower than, than for example, leisure uh, type uh, demand is expected to rebound. So do you think uh, events could be one of the, the key drivers for, uh, for hotels in terms of recovery? Absolutely. I, I really think that you're going to see people very excited to flock to some of these events too. 
I think there's many a person that you talk to is excited for their next concert, um, festival, those types of things I think are likely to attract large, large amounts of people. I would think also there's going to be some drive, at least in the short term, to work out how those events can be run maybe in a different way. Um, I know that in parts of Europe, for example, they had run some festivals with large amounts of social distancing outside and people in little pens for concerts and so on. But, you know, you still get the same experience. You have the same, maybe a smaller crowd, but in a safer, safer way. And I think that is going to make things interesting also because knowing the difference in the fact that there are a different level of, of um, seats or um, people that can attend the event, but maybe the same level of demand could be very interesting because that means that you might actually sell out the number of seats that you have much faster, but there's less demand for rooms, for example. Or in some cases, the events in some places where um, there's maybe lower levels of restrictions will sell out extremely quickly, especially this first year. So knowing that, adapting to that will be very important. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And um, we're also uh, monitoring destinations that are starting to come back first. For example, uh, the UK right now, uh, there's a clear roadmap on how restrictions will be lifted and I think a realistic uh, roadmap. As the next question, I wanted to ask, um, do you want to change your algorithm going forward based on markets that are starting to, to recover? What kind of changes can ideas users uh, expect in terms of uh, algorithms going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the changes that we made at the, the start of the pandemic actually set the system up well to make sure that it looks for both signs of recovery in the last two weeks, but also in the future business on the books for the next 30 days. We are continuing to monitor that situation, especially for, I think, destination markets are the ones to watch probably the most, especially places where people will feel more safe going on vacation. Things like resorts, beach destinations, of course, those types of property, a lot of industry research suggests that they will see boom first. People feel safe and comfortable being outside on the beach with safe social distancing between family groups and so on. Those are areas, though, where what you see once restrictions are loosened is a fairly extreme ramp up in booking pace. And it's the, the only actual actual similarity that, that I've seen in, in some other places is like a special event the, from a, a booking curve or a ramp up perspective. Because as soon as the an announcement is, is made about restrictions being released, for many future occupancy dates, you start to see this big spike. And I, I know that there was some of the data that we have shows that people from the UK started to make large volumes of reservations as the restriction announcements were, were, were released um, very recently. So those types of things really show that prolific pickup. And so another thing that we are researching, um, it's actually in, in testing is a way to even more proactively use that future data to project similar days of week. So, for example, if in a destination you see a large pickup on Saturdays, which is, is very likely the case in those destinations, you can project that same type of pickup forwards, but not beyond the seasonal boundary. So you don't want to dilute the normal seasonal pattern that the system's already starting to ramp up from the past ramp up that it's seeing, because where it sees that it will significantly project the demand back up again as it sees that pickup. But you do want to react quickly where there's an increase in room sold that maybe wasn't expected or that you know we weren't able to to see any evidence of before it was announced because we, we don't have those direct inputs like the lockdown restriction announcements or of course very much data about what they will do because this is this is a new thing for everyone yeah it'll be interesting to see how you know this recovery develops and and how different destinations will, will recover and how, how they can leverage different sources of data and, uh, and revenue man management systems like yourselves in optimizing for this recovery and try to recover some of that lost revenue that was lost over the uh, past one and a half years. I think for me, the most important thing on that is that we don't assume that what's gotten us here is going to continue to take us forwards. And 
that we can continue to rely on the techniques that have maybe served us well for several decades, that you really have to continue to focus. And that's why we've used tools. We pick up examples of cases that are raised either internally or externally, things that are noticed by our monitoring tools or by our users, where there's areas that we aren't reacting as well as we should, and really just look at what can we learn from those things and, and learn and adapt as quickly as possible. Some of them might only be helpful for a few months, but they will help thousands of properties. And some of them might be helpful as an enduring basis, because actually some of those changes I described earlier are actually much more common on an ongoing basis in hospitality, but they don't occur in other parts of the travel sector from experience, for example, that our parent company has working with, with even airlines, for example, that you, you don't see that really dramatic type of shift between product purchasing and so on. Because of course, when you go on to purchase an airline ticket, you have to work pretty hard usually to find a flexible ticket. Even now, that's uh, that's that's usually hard, other than changeable for a fee or waived cancellation and change fees. So, we have educated our customers differently in in hospitality than we have in other parts of travel. So, I think that continued adaptation to what's really happening is is going to continue to be critical. It's going to be uh, exciting times ahead for sure. As a closing question, what event is it that you're looking most forward to going once there will be a possibility? I'll probably pick the same as everyone else. I'm definitely looking forward to my, my next concert. The last one was too long ago. <laughs> um, there's nothing like being outside with, uh, as you said, with a, a pint, as they would say on your side of the Atlantic, and uh, a beer here with some, some live music outside in the sunshine. So hopefully, hopefully soon enough. That or maybe a visit to the mountains. We'll, we'll see which one comes first. Sounds good. What about yourself? What are you looking forward to? Good question. An open air concert sounds good. Depends on what will be the availability. I'm a fan of the British uh, rap band, The Streets. They were oh, supposed yeah. to have a, a concert in uh, uh, or a show in Clapham Common, which unfortunately got got postponed. But I hope uh, it will happen. What about Maybe. yourself? I'm hoping to get out to Seattle and see more of Washington State, actually see some of the mountains. And uh, there's a three national parks sort of within close driving distance of uh, this city. So hopefully soon as a uh, vaccine ramps up um, here, of course, we've uh, seen large changes and announcements this past couple of weeks. So that's, that's exciting. Thank you very much for your time and uh, the conversation and your feedback on how you guys handle the pandemic and your plans for the future and uh, stay safe. And thanks for the, the chat. Yeah, thank you so much too for inviting me. I really appreciate it. And I really also just want to say thank you to everyone. I know it's been a really difficult year for everyone, both personally and professionally in a way that people never would have expected we've had to deal with and, and adapt to both working from home or where that was even possible, of course, given the market that we work in. And this is, of course, first and foremost, a health and a, a human crisis. And really, we have to continue to band together to support one another. So I really hope that everyone stays safe, happy and healthy, um, especially to you and your family and, and to everyone in our, our wider industry. So thank you so much for your, for your time and allowing me to chat to you about what we've been doing over the last year or so. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and likewise, I, I completely uh, agree. Stay safe and I hope uh, the best for your uh, loved ones and, uh, and everyone in the, the industry. Hopefully we will get through this tough time soon. And uh, I can already see the light at the end of the tunnel. So uh, hopefully it won't be long.